Welcome everyone to my channel called Harvey Kaffer, brought to you by the Dar El Harb Center for Islamic Studies and me, your host, Harvey Kaffer. So however you found this channel, it's my most fervent hope you'll return to learn more about the ideology that attempts to pass itself off as the religion of peace, Islam, and how it affects us folks known in Islam as Kaffers. This episode will look different from previous ones because I am introducing the new improved set here at the Dar El Harb Center for Islamic Studies. Voila! Maybe now this place will look more like a classroom instead of like a storage room or something. So, on with spreading a little Kafir type knowledge. If you watch many videos about Islam, you might be familiar with the controversy about the Quran's origins and whether it had different versions during its compilation. Well, this isn't about that. How the Quran originated isn't as important to us Kafirs as what it says now and how it has been translated in different ways for different reasons. I have two versions of the Quran now since picking up my little my little pocket version of Islam's holy word recently at a local Goodwill. I have bookmarked my favorite verses in the 2013 Good Word Books version of the Quran, which was translated by Indian Islamic scholar Wahid Uddin Khan. I researched Khan, who is of the Islam is a religion of peace school of thought, and his little Quran reeks of that slant. He annoyingly refers to his God in his Quran as God with a capital G to help obfuscate the difference between his master, Allah, and the Jewish Christian deity, Yahweh. I've marked corresponding verses in Spencer's critical Quran, you see there, so let's do some comparisons between these two Qurans. First, we'll check out Surah 4, verse 34, because I was told long ago by fellow Kafir, Dr. Bill Warner, it was the best verse to use to determine an informative Quran from a persuasive Quran. So here it is from the Khan's version first. Men are protectors of women because God has made some of them excel others and because they spend their wealth on them. So virtuous women are obedient and guard in the husband's absence what God would have them guard. As for those from whom you apprehend infidelity, admonish them, then refuse to share their beds, and finally hit them lightly. Then, if they obey you, take no further action against them, for God is high and great. Now, the Spencer version. Men are in charge of women because Allah has made the one superior to the other, and because they spend of their property. So good women are obedient, guarding in secret what Allah has guarded. As for those from whom you fear disobedience, give them a warning and banish them to separate beds and beat them. Then if they obey you, do not seek a way against them. Indeed, Allah is always high exalted, great, according to Spencer. The conversion has a two-line footnote about a beating 
being lightly, lightly, to be merely symbolic, whereas Spencer's informative book has a third of a page of footnotes on the verse, including a dozen different interpretations of how severely a beating can be administered by a husband on his disobedient wives and refers to a hadith in which Muhammad's child bride, Aisha, after observing a green bruise on another wife of the Oma caused by a beating from her husband, is said to have commented, I have not seen any woman suffering as much as the believing women. Let's try another verse. How about Surah 3, verse 28? Robert Spencer goes first this time. Let not the believers take unbelievers for their friends in preference to believers. Whoever does that has no connection with Allah unless you are guarding yourselves against them, taking security. Allah bids you beware of him. To Allah is the journey. This is followed by two-thirds of a page of footnotes on different translations of the word for friends in Arabic and how this verse is impacted by Takiya. Hopefully you remember Takiya from an earlier episode by the Dar El Harb Center for Islamic Studies, our most viewed video to date. But continuing with 328, the Wahid Uddin Khan version in its footnotes says, and I'm quoting here, A believer treats all human beings with justice and fairness without differentiating between Muslims and non-Muslims, but friendship with non-Muslims who are at war with Islam is not lawful. Well, I guess that leaves me out. Then Khan translates the same verse to read, Let not the believers take those who deny the truth for their allies in preference to the believers. Anyone who does that will isolate himself completely from God, unless it be to protect yourselves against them in this way. God admonishes you to fear him, for to God shall all return. This pretty much repeats the sentiment of the critical Quran by Spencer without going into the messy details. Let's try one more verse comparison with Sarah 5 verses 32 and 33. We will start this time with a what heed Uden Khan translation of the often used who saves one human saves the whole world verse 32 that goes that is why we laid it down for the children of Israel that whoever killed a human being except as punishment for murder or for spreading corruption in the land shall be regarded as having killed all mankind and whoever saved a human life shall be regarded as having saved all mankind. Our messengers came to them with clear signs, but many of them continued to commit excesses in the land. Khan continues in verse 33 of Surah Al-Ma'ida, Those that make war against God and his messenger and spread disorder in the land shall be put to death or crucified or have their hands and feet cut off on alternate sides or be banished from the country. They shall be disgraced in this world and then severely punished in the hereafter. It's a shame they don't have that last part for folks that take stuff out of context but again, that falls under Takiya. There are no footnotes in the Khan version as the verse spells out what is in store 
or troublemakers like me. In comparison, Spencer's The Critical Quran says, For that reason we decree for the children of Israel that whoever kills a human being for anything other than manslaughter or corruption on the earth, it will be as if he had killed all mankind. And whoever saves the life of one person, it will be as if he had saved the life of all mankind. Our messengers came to them of old with clear proofs, but afterwards, indeed, many of them committed excesses on earth. Then it goes on to say in the next verse, for context, the only reward for those who make war upon Allah and his messenger and struggle to sow corruption on earth will be that they will be killed or crucified or have their hands and feet cut off on opposite sides or be expelled from the land. Such will be their degradation in this world and in the hereafter. Theirs will be an awful doom. Wow, as I said in an earlier episode, that doesn't sound so innocent when one reads the whole verse in context. But then the conversion is also full of wrath when it is read in context. So I guess there are some pigs you ain't getting all the mud off of no matter how hard you scrub, as we say back home. Well, I'm pretty sure everyone could see where this was heading a dozen minutes ago, but here goes anyway so I can get this episode ended. I can't recommend you obtain one of these pocket size Wrath of Khan Qurans unless you already have a copy of Robert Spencer's Critical Quran. This persuasive translation, as I call it, is intended to present Islam as the religion of peace. It even says that in its introduction which is ascribed as a footnote a few times for its more jihad-filled passages. But if you have a copy of The Critical Quran by Robert Spencer with its extensive commentary in the footnotes to help you understand what you are being told, then by all means pick up a copy of one of these pocket-sized Rathacon versions of the Quran. But remember, it's for entertainment purposes only. So you can use it to amaze and impress your friends with the verse that condones pedophilia, Surah 65, verse 4. Wow, that went on a lot longer than I had wanted. I really just wanted to introduce the new blackboard set and show off my little goodwill find, but I end up having to research this Wahid Odin Khan fella to understand his spin on this pocket sized translation version, which I've dubbed the Wrath of Khan, which I can carry with me to whip out to entertain and amaze my friends with all the fun and interesting things I have learned as a Kafir. And one of those things I have learned as I study Islam is. I'm already a Kafir. I might as well be a Warner. Please leave your comments below and remember, no Islam, my fellow Kafirs, so there is no submission. Wow.